my talk today is about my new book, The Art of Preluding, Deconstructing and Reconstructing the Preludes of J.S. Bach's Well-Tempered Clavier 1 and 2. My goal over the next 45 minutes will be to talk about what motivated me to write this book, some of the ideas contained therein, and how it might uh, potentially be of use to you, either as a, a music theorist, or as a performer, or whatever it is that you happen to do related to music. Jonathan already mentioned in the introduction that much of my work as of late is involved in a sort of uh, rehabilitation, you might say, of thorough bass and trying to recover uh, how thorough bass was understood, particularly in German-speaking lands in the 17th and 18th centuries, and trying to understand how we can use thorough bass today as uh, not only as an, uh, an accompanimental approach, but also as a theoretical approach. My starting point for my dissertation and for this book was a testimonial that Bach wrote in 1727 for his pupil, Friedrich Gottlieb Wild. And Bach wrote, quote, Wild has taken special instruction from me in the clavier, thorough bass, and the fundamental principles of composition that are derived from them. When I read this in the Bach Documente, in the second volume, in the first volume, excuse me, I was just totally floored. I thought, this is incredible. I have to see what this is all about. See what could Bach possibly have meant by this statement, because to my knowledge, nobody else has really talked about this yet. Now, we already knew that Bach began his instruction with thorough bass, but I think it could have been easy up to this point to dismiss that and say, well, he was just getting his students started. But this um, statement I think is really important and uh, one way of understanding my book is the attempt to probe the ramifications of this statement um, as it applies to Bach's preludes. Looks like somebody else just came. Um, not sure if I can have to let them in. Well, I just did. Okay. Um, Let's continue on. And so you, you might be familiar with this. This is from the um, Klavierbüchlein for Wilhelm Friedman Bach. And this is, of course, the C major prelude from book one of the Well-Tempered Clavier. Now we need to be careful with this because it's inauthentic in the sense that it hasn't been completely corrected by Bach. So you don't want to play this version from beginning to end. But all I want to highlight here is that the figuration broke off after seven bars and went to this chordal approach that can be adequately described using thorough bass figures, even though there are no thorough bass figures here. So we have this separation, this distinction between the chordal content and the rhetorical overlay. And I'm going to come back to that a couple times throughout the talk today. This is another example. This is actually from my bo from my book. On the very bottom, we see the C uh, C sharp major prelude transposed to C major. More on that later. And in the middle, we see a version that is authentic from Bach, where he just wrote out the chords in five pure voices, and wrote arpeggio. On the top, we see my analytical reduction as I uh, supply to every one of the preludes in the Well-Tempered Clavier. I use mostly a four-voice approach, but um, you can see here in bar two, I, I added another voice, like CPE Bach and Heinichen, for example, they say you don't need to be totally strict about it. And I uh, took that approach in my analytical reduction. 
you'll also see that I analyzed the scale degrees of the baseline throughout, as well as the keys and their relationship to the main key as a Roman numeral. Then, of course, the throw base figures are between the staves, and on the top, I analyzed what I considered to be the voice leading patterns or schemas of the piece. So this one begins with a tonic pedal point, with a typical quiescenza figure. And everywhere that there's an arrow, that is the obligatory resolution of a syncopatio dissonance. So here, it's not an upper voice, but it's the bass voice, which is obligated to descend. And I call that a suspended bass modulation. I'll talk about that a little bit more later. So I mentioned the word syncopatio. It's important in box day and actually all the way back to Tinctoris uh, to distinguish between syncopatio and transitus as the two main ways of using dissonances. And a syncopatio is just a, a fancy word for a syncopation or a ligature, uh, a suspension. But I like to use the word syncopatio because it reminds us that originally, at least, a syncopated dissonance or a, a syncopatio dissonance had a rhythmic element to it. And that is uh, by far the more important type of dissonance um, in comparison with the transitus type, which subsumes passing a neighbor dissonances. By the way, I wanted to say if, if there are any questions about slides in particular, uh, feel free to note the slide number at the bottom and I can come back to it afterwards uh, during the discussion. So I like to use Bach's arpeggio version of this prelude as an exercise with students. How would you ornament this piece if you hadn't seen the original and you it was up to you to add a different type of figuration to it because Bach didn't specify. So in that way we can kind of imagine the bottom version here as just one of many possible ways of playing this piece. My approach in my book also has to do with two sources that I've recently written about by Jakob Adl and Johann Velad. And you can uh, see the, the article in Music Theory Online where I talk about these and compare them and see them sort of as counterparts of each other. This is a very short prelude by Velad um, in his treatise where he, it's basically an improvisation treatise. And he gives an ornamented version here. I think it's only 11 bars long or so. And then in the second stage, he only gives a figured bass line. And similar to um, box approach, he writes in the preface that you should add your own figuration to this figured bass line. So again, we have an example of thorough bass acting as the backbone for an improvisation or a composition. And of course, um, CPE Bach did the same thing. We'll talk about him in a second. This is Jakob Adlung. I recently finished the translation of his treatise, which I think is very, very important. It's called the Anweisung zum Fantasieren, or the Instruction in Improvisation to, to, fan, uh, to Fantasize, which was the word in the 18th century, or maybe it would be best translated as to extemporize today. And um, Jakob Adlung's treatise is very important because, to my knowledge, it is the first treatise we know of that definitely proves that music in the 18th century was understood in terms of voice leading patterns. Of course, the, the, the evidence up to this point was almost incontrovertible that this music was organized in terms of Satzmodelle or schemas or whatever you want to call them. At, at Eastman, we call them paradigms. Um, I like voice leading pattern and voice leading model or voice leading module even more though, to uh, first of all de-emphasize the aspects of music cognition that go hand in hand with the word schema and schemata. 
and second of all to emphasize the modular aspect of this music so modularity is just like Legos you've got these pre-existing building blocks and you can arrange them in a variety of freely configurable uh, ways and that's a really productive way of understanding 18th century music in general 17th century also and Bach's uh, preludes in particular so if you're interested in checking out um, Jakob Adlung's treatise, you can get the translation online as a PDF, as well as look at my introduction with Michael Mao. So, of course, um, uh, Vlad was not the only person to conceive of music making in terms of thorough bass. C.P.E. Bach, as you probably all know, at the second half, at the end of the second half of his treatise, gives this bass line and says that this can act as the foundation for your own improvisation. And then he gives an example of how to ornament, how to, re how to inflect these chords, these, this chord progression, rhetorically. And I think this is so valuable for us because it's not that complicated. If you play through this, you'll see that it's essentially runs arpeggios, a couple parallel sixths here. And I think that is a very encouraging fact for us. Now you could say, first of all, that there are stylistic differences between C.P.E. Bach and how his father probably tended to improvise a fantasy. I don't know, maybe. Of course, we can look at uh, pieces, organ works by, by Bach that um, that are called fan Fantasia, and there are certainly similarities. You might also say, well, a prelude is not a fantasy. And that's true. A free fantasy, as you can see, is without meter, and its neighboring keys are more distantly related than we usually see in a prelude. Nevertheless, I believe both of them were and should be today still understood in terms of thorough bass and voice leading patterns. So I mentioned before regarding this the C sharp major prelude that um, I analyze the scale degrees of the bass line. This approach is fairly well founded in terms of Bach because his pupil and close assistant named Kaiser analyzed the C sharp uh, C minor fugue and the D minor prelude from the well-tempered clavier in the following way. This is my transcription of this. So Kaiser went through almost the whole piece and wrote the scale degrees of the bass line. So 8 is just 1 and F is presumably finalis. And over this he wrote the bass related intervals the thorough bass figures. And I think this is also astounding because in my, to my mind we can pretty much assume that Kaiser got this from Bach. To me it's unimaginable that Bach didn't approve of this at least, if, if not suggest it to Kaiser. And this connection is really important, this coupling of a base scale degree in a given context, so like stepwise or leaping, and the stepwise context is covered by the rule of the octave, and a network or constellation of intervals over this base scale degree. So as you'll see, my approach here is completely base focused. It is not at all root focused. Because, as far as I can tell, the tracking of root motions as syntactically significant was an idea that first made it to Germany after Bach's death and influenced people like Kernberger, who presumably studied with Bach, maybe, maybe not. But it certainly had something to do with Bach's circle. So this is a completely base scale degree centered approach. 
And I think, just to name one of the advantages of this approach in improvisation, is that the point of reference remains stable. So by the 18th century, it was uncommon in thorough bass realization to do two and two. I'm not saying it's unheard of, but mostly it was left hand, bass, and three, let's just say as a standard four voice, because you can do it in two voices, you can do it in one voice, you can do it in five, you can do it in you know as many as you can grab with a full voice style. But my point being that if um, you're only playing the bass with the left hand, you have a constant point of reference for intervallic measurement. And that is really handy because the chordal root doesn't get tossed around from voice to voice and you don't have to constantly be measuring from this other voice this other point of reference. I already mentioned Heinichen and CPE Bach. They are, to my mind, the two most important throw based treatises, at least in German, um, and they're both, both closely associated with Bach. I even think that CPE Bach's treatise is essentially based on Heinichen. I've got a running bullet point list of 50 bullet points that are common between the two of them. So then the question becomes, did, did C.P.E. Bach get it directly from Heineken or did he get it through his father? Because he says in his treatise that I had no other teacher in uh, composition and keyboard playing other than my father. But interestingly enough, Heineken's second treatise, the one from tw 1728, was present in Bach's house in Leipzig. So. I, I explore the ramifications of that fact in my dissertation in greater detail, but I would say one of my running uh, theses or uh, one of the things that I'm all about in my research right now is exploring this connection. What would it mean if we applied Heinchen's analytical approach to box music? And I think that's an incredibly productive synergy. There's so much there to find because Heineken is essentially taking the traditional way of looking at consonants and dissonance in a vocal context as it had been communicated since the Renaissance in usually a dyadic con context that you know these old these old counterpoint treatises from the 16th and 17th centuries that usually say you know, if the tenor and the discant make this interval, what's the next interval that you can make? And and he takes that, this dyadic approach of interval to interval, and he expands it and reframes it in terms of polyphonic thorough bass playing, and basically shows that thorough bass is the tool that enables you, as a keyboard player, to conceive of multiple lines simultaneously. So these old dyadic, this dyadic conception was fine if we're talking about vocal improvisation, where all you, you know, you're singing on the book and you see this, this cantus firmus, and all you have to do is sing a line to it, and you know who knows what happens when your line clashes against the, the one your 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 uh, neighbor is singing. It seems like maybe it didn't matter that much, but if you're gonna improvise polyphonically yourself with your with your hands, you need a way of simplifying this dyadic approach because it would be too complicated. So that's um, Heineken's approach is that it's, I think, a, a product, it lies in a productive middle ground where you can still understand harmonic, uh, harmony dyadically in terms of the bass-related intervals. But at the same time, it's conceived in terms of grouping structure with the hands and common intervallic constellations or chords, not that I avoid the word chords, but I like to say intervallic constellations to uh, emphasize that each interval is reckoned individually with the bass. Here's a table that outlines my basic approach in my book. If we look at small, medium, and large scale at, as chord phrases and entire pieces. So when we're at the small scale, we're talking about chord content, that's the bass reckoned intervals of throw bass figures, and chord connection, the voice leading and particularly the resolution of dissonances or syncopatio dissonances in, in particular. At the middle scale, we're talking about voice leading patterns or modules or schemas or whatever. And these can br be broken into three typical categories of cadences, sequences, and 
the rule of the octave, or I like to say it as I like to say rules of the octave because there's a common misunderstanding that I've noticed in, in among my students that they think there's only one way of doing it and that's very important to work against that that there's multiple ways of harmonizing a, a scale in the bass or more specifically a step in the bass because the rule of the octave is essentially a meta collocation people like to say who are into schemata theory it's a meta collocation it's a collocation of collocations and you don't see the whole thing in music but you see segments thereof and then you have the ornament ornamenting of the uh, voice leading patterns I'm not sure if that's really a middle phrase phenomenon but I just put it there that's the rhetorical inflection and then chaining or the fancy word is concatenation of the voice leading patterns one after the other that's the aspect of modularity and then of course you have to choose and you have to order your neighboring keys. Regarding voice leading patterns, I have listed what I consider to be the most important ones, cadences, rules of the octave, there I have it in the plural, and sequences in my compendium, which you can download for free on my website. Here's a segment of the rule of the octave, just from 1 to 5 and 5 to 1, that's how um, more or less how Heineken gives it and you can see here how I use colors for example to show the invertibility of the upper voices and this was really common in the 18th century that you would practice a thorough bass exercise beginning in the octave third and fifth position so those positions refer to the interval between the outer voices at the start so the lowest interval here or the lowest uh, of the right hand staves here starting with the red note in the soprano is the octave position and the third position and the fifth position and the colors show how you can follow the voice leading progression of each individual voice and um, how you essentially you can introduce the concept of invertible counterpoint in a very simple way um, because you don't have to worry about uh, fifths re inverting to fourths because non-bass related perfect fourths are considered a consonant. Okay, so that's just to show one example from the compendium. Here's another one, a three-voice example of compound cadences. I wanted to show this to emphasize how um, I, I'm ashamed I'm ashamed to say it, but I'll admit it. I did a bachelor's in composition, I won't say where, and I never heard the word clausula. I, I, you know, I wrote inventions or whatever, tried to, and um, never heard the word clausula. Now, I know it's mentioned in, in Peter Schubert's um, modal counterpoint book. That's the only book in English that I can find that mentioned clausula, but I think they're so important because they emphasize the linear aspect of voice leading. And so for here, uh, here for example, the red voice is the syncopated discant clausula or soprano clausula, it doesn't matter, one seven one, and it's tied to make a, a suspension. So if the discant clausula is suspended and it's in an upper voice, you're dealing with a compound cadence. And that's the most important type of cadence in the Baroque. And you can see here, it's uh, in the octave position or the third position. And by cycling through the different positions of the right hand, and by transposing, you internalize um, the patterns, the voice leading patterns, and then you are ready to uh, put them into practice at a moment's notice because you have built this vocabulary. I mentioned neighboring keys. This is Heineken's famous circle. It's like the circle of fifths, but the circle of fifths, but not exactly. Uh, he still got C major at the 12 o'clock position, but to the right he goes to A minor and then G major and E minor. And he says that this is a, a sure method of preluding. Imp I think we should res resurrect the word preluding in its verb form because it emphasizes that the prelude was um, primarily in the 18th century an improvised genre. So if you start in C major, Heineken says you may modulate to any neighboring key, A minor or D minor, or you can skip over maximum of one key at a time. So if you're in C major, you could go to G major or F major. Closely related keys at this time were those keys that are plus or minus one maximum of one accidental. So just the major and minor triads, like if you're in C major, you've got D minor, E minor, F major, G major, and A minor. So the only closely related key that you can't go to directly from C major would be E minor. Now, I tried to make this a little bit more approachable in my book, so I use this metaphor of the walled park of closely related keys. 
These are the same closely related keys that Heineken talks about, but I like to conceive of it as a walk in the park. But there's a wall around the park, so you can't go farther than this unless you want to fantasize, in which case you go, you jump the wall and go off into the woods. Um, but so the idea is that there's only one way to get into the park, and that's at the main key. And I, I've showed the key relationships in terms of Roman numerals here. And if you're going to start in C major, the first path is almost, you know, this it's almost in in um, invariably G major, the key of the fifth degree. So these are the these groves of trees, and you've got these footpaths that you can walk um, between them. So you might improvise, starting in C major, you walk over to G major, and then you have to pass by C major in order to leave the park. So you have to pass, you have to modulate back to the main key to come home. And you can see here, there's no path connecting C major to E minor. In the way stands the uh, modal mixture swamp. Now this is kind of a joke, but I added it even though it's not in Heineken because it shows up in so many of uh, Bach's works that you you can walk along the park, but you don't want to get stuck in it. And composers very often use the park as a sort of threat. You know, this like we're going to stand on the dominant, uh, like a dominant pedal point before the end of the prelude. And if we're in if, if we're in C major, we're going to like threaten C minor or even G minor. We're going to use chords from those two keys to sort of threaten that we might not make it back. So that's my own addition, not really historically based. But this. Uh, you might say is one of the main reasons that I decided to transpose all of the works in the well-tempered clavier into C major and A minor. Now, I know that may be shocking to some, but the more I read 18th century works, at least German ones, C major and A minor were really the base pairs. I, I, if you look at Heineken's treatise, if you look at C.P.E. Bach's treatise, he basically says, you know, start in the easy key like C major and A minor and module and, and transpose these examples into other keys. So I wanted to essentially collapse all of Bach's major mode pieces into C major and minor mode pieces into A minor so that we could imagine them as walks through the same park of closely related keys. How can you prelude in a major key? And by collapsing them, I know uh, some people might accuse me of amateurism, but uh, I really think there's a pedagogical benefit to be had by comparing them, especially if you, let's say you're playing something in, in uh, F-sharp major or whatever, and then you conf you're confronted with it in my book in C major, that's a really productive frustration because you are forced to reckon with these with the same intervallic constellations, but with a different geography of the keyboard. I say geography because I mean the the hills of the black keys. You know, y you've got this geography of how the how each key feels in the hands, how the black keys are distributed, and it's the same constellations, but in a different geography. And when you, if you can transpose something, you've essentially mastered it. I mean, I'm not the first person to say that. Even Nadia Boulanger required her pupils to be able to play. Um, works by Bach in multiple keys. So it's that process of transfer that is central to learning. If you can transfer an idea into another context, even completely separate from a musical context, that is proof that you've understood it. So I've been, I mentioned A minor a lot. Here it's the same park. But now our reference is A minor. We enter and exit. It's like the gate over at C major was closed, and a new gate was opened at A minor. That's now the key of the first degree. And the first path here is mostly going to be C major, the relative major, although very often, you know, this, the uh, composers will go to the minor dominant. But essentially, we're dealing with the same park. So I, can, I considered a couple years ago more than a couple years ago when I started this project, I thought, well, why don't I do the, all the minor keys in C minor? Wouldn't that be better? But actually, I realized that it's not, because otherwise we can't compare apples to apples. Here, it's the same stock of modulatory goals that we're dealing with, and that's really helpful for comparing not major mode and minor mode pieces but uh, with each other, but uh, between each other to see how do you navigate the park if you're starting in a minor minor mode. I wanted to briefly mention a an unavoidable ambiguity 
involved in the process of reduction. Here's the original in its transpose form. Reduction 1 to a consonant framework. Reduction 2 with a syncopated discant clausula in the soprano as a compound cadence with a uh, syncopatio dissonance. There is no way to know what's the right analysis of this because of the delayed entry of the C-sharp in the original. It just depends. I like to use the analogy of a microscope, that the act of analysis has to set the microscope at the, at the proper depth, you might say. That you have to, um, whoops, I didn't want to go further, but I'll just keep talking. You don't want to, um, you want to make sure that you set your microscope to the right, to the right depth. So this is a point where I might mention Schenker, because some people would say, well, isn't this just Schenkerian analysis? And no, it uh, shares certain commonalities with Schenker. But one of my goals of this book is to rehabilitate the process of reductive analysis by distancing it from Schenker, by breaking, e breaking or, or at least weakening his monopoly on reductive analysis. Reductive analysis is a concept that uh, goes at least as far back to, back to 1700 and certainly be beforehand uh, not in a thorough base context. And so what does this have to do with the microscope? I believe that the Schenkerian approach zooms way too far out with their microscope. They, they have to have it on the maximal setting essentially because they have to see every piece as monotonal. And that to my mind is the Achilles heel among others, of um, Schenker's approach, that he views modulations to neighboring keys as chords in the main key. We can talk about that more in the Q&A if you like. So here's another example. I'll play the, the original on, on the bottom here. Reduction one, zoomed out a little bit further. It's only got passing dissonance, the passing sense. Now I know I said that the arrows are only for the resolution of a syncopatio dissonance, but the problem with the passing dissonance is that it's actually ambiguous. You don't know if it's an unprepared, unaccented syncopatio. So I just put the arrows here to emphasize that this tone is going to descend. Okay, that was one microscope setting. Now we can zoom in a little bit further, and here I've, I've maintained the baseline. So now we, now we can see that the, base, this, the baseline is just an ascending scale, and now on beat three, and on beat one, we can see the syncopatio dissonances that I had reduced away in reduction one. So here's reduction two. I decided on reduction two because I wanted to show this much detail. But reduction one might be preferable to somebody else. And depending on what you want to show, that can also be correct. I mentioned rhetorical inflection as one of the, I think it was level four in that table. I got really, really into rhetoric a few years ago as I was working on a Svaling project. And I realized something that nobody had really explained to me, and I wish that they had much er far earlier, is that rhetoric can only be understood in terms of a baseline. That you, n in order to understand the concept of rhetoric, you need the idea of uninflected speech. Now it's kind of a hypothetical because I would argue that there's no speech that is truly uninflected. But let's just say it's, a, it's, a, it's an ideal concept 
that is very useful to measure against, like our baseline. We measure against the baseline. Here's an example. The temperature is 90 degrees Fahrenheit with a relative humidity of 90%. That's a fact absent traditional rhetorical content. It's just communicating a fact, not trying to persuade you of anything, because that's what rhetoric is. Rhetoric is the art of persuasive speech. If we wanted to apply various rhetorical figures to this uninflected speech, we could apply alliteration, same starting syllable. It's an alliteration itself, SSS. We won't want for warmer weather. Kind of silly, but gets the point across. Hyperbole is exaggeration not meant to be taken literally. It's so hot I could melt. It's another way of saying, gosh darn, it's hot out. A simile, A is like B and hyperbole. It's like the surface of the sun outside. Now, I don't know, don't know how to say this next one. I had to make it up. I had to look it up. I didn't make it up. <laughs> it's hot, I say. Hot, hot, hot. This emphatic repetition. Light totes, I'm not sure if that's how you say this, would be an understatement in which an affirmative is expressed by the negative of the contrary and a colloquialism, so informal language including slang. It sure ain't with winter anymore. Those are all the same statement in a way inflected rhetorically with different figures. So that's where the idea, or that's where the word f musical figure comes from, comes from language, because, well, in, in the 17th and the 18th century, music was very often understood as a, as a type of refined speech. And so this was borrowed, one of uh, many, many terms borrowed from uh, grammar and linguistics, or let's just say language, for music. And so let's do the same with the Romanesca. Down four, up two, tracking the bass motion, which is also the root motion. This is a musical equivalent of uninflected speech. Now I realize that I'm doing exactly what Robert Udigan said not to do in the appendix of his music in the Gallant style, namely why he defines his schemas very wisely in terms of scale degrees not in a meter and not in a specific key and thorough bass. So it's it's very abstract and he's wise to do that. But and, and well he says the danger of of giving them in C major and and in four four, exactly what I did here, is that you can make a false association and think that this is the ideal. It's not. This is actually already been individuated. That's what a word I like to use for the application of the rhetorical inflection to the un uninflected speech. So let's look at some other ways we could individuate this. So some broken chords with octave leaps. Different way. Doesn't quite sound Baroque with that accented neighbor, but whatever. Tonicizations with some commas. The commas is a 7-1 in the bass with the 6-5 chord. be understood as a as a carousel variant some suspensions so those are those are all still pretty generic figures we haven't individuated this inflect uh, uninflected speech very much but of course you can just like in language you can combine multiple figures simultaneously like I do at F where we've got some free imitation some tonicization some suspensions and octave leaps in the bass and at this point, you might say, well, I've never heard a Romanesca that sounded quite like this one. Maybe that is individuated enough or inflected enough to become a unique statement. Earlier, in the C sharp major prelude, I mentioned this suspended bass modulation. If you want to modulate to the dominant, this is the best way to do it. I also realize I'm doing something that my doctoral advisor said, uh, his name is Felix Diergard, and he wrote an excellent editorial in 18th century music. And he gives a great overview about the last 20 years of research into 18th century music. And he says that research needs to get beyond the flag planting stage of schema 
theory, you know, where everybody is sort of on the lookout for this new schema that they can plant their terminological flag in and say, you know, I'm here, hear me roar as a theorist, this thing's mine. So at the risk of doing that, at least I gave it a, a uh, descriptive name and not a, an arbitrary name after some, I could have named it the Deer Garden, but <laughs> he wouldn't like that. Um, so anyway, this is, I would, I haven't done a statistical analysis, but I reckon that Bach modulates to the dominant at least in half of the way, half of the preludes in the well-tempered Kavir using this. So the bass is tied over, one goes to four, becomes four in the, in, the, in the dominant key, and then we go four to three. And using the rule of the octave, you know that four to three should take a six, four, two chord going to a six chord. And that bass is obligated to descend, so. There's also a less common variant where you modulate down a third. It starts the same, but with the G sharp, it goes further. That's just a stock pattern, really good to have up your sleeve if you want to modulate to the dominant in a way that sounds Baroque. I'll just mention the, the underlying logic of this way of thinking, because in my student days, I was very into Nadia Boulanger and her way of thinking and studied as intensely as I could her music theory, her pedagogy. And y if you look on my website or just search on Google, you'll find these Boulanger cadences. And after having practiced them for dozens and dozens and dozens of hours, and I could, mo I could memorize, I had them memorized and, and could play them in any key. And uh, what I realized is that it was all too base, it was all too root oriented. That what was really missing from that approach was, uh, that that approach is based on common chord modulation. And that's at least what I learned in my s days in the States, this idea that the chord is the basic building block of music. And if you want to modulate, you need a common chord. Well, I think a m much more flexible and historically oriented way of thinking about it would be a common bass tone that you take a bass tone and you re reorient it, you reorient, for example, this C in a new key. And that's much more flexible. And I'll tell you why. As an example, let's say you're in C major and you want to modulate to A minor. Well, Nadia Boulanger does something like... And what I guess I couldn't put my finger on years ago was that Roman numeral three or a 5-3 chord on bass degree 3 doesn't happen in A minor. It doesn't sound right as a common chord. If you have a C in the bass in A minor, that's m almost all the time going to require a 6 chord, not a 5-3 chord. So this way of understanding harmony as an intervallic constellation is much more flexible than uh, thinking about the chord as the basic unit of music. Instead, we want to talk, we want to understand the interval as the basic unit of music, and harmony is a constellation of intervals. Regarding that, I give an example of the rule of the octave or a stepwise bass progression: one, seven, one, two, three, four, five, six, five, four, three, two, one. I realize the connection six, seven is missing, but I just gave it the way that Heineken gives it, and the black. Intervallic constellations are the more common ones, and the gray ones are very, very important exceptions. They're rhetorically inflected exceptions, you know, like a fully diminished seven chord on seven. It's not that that never happens, but the default, if you're going to go seven one, would be a six five chord or a six chord. And I highly recommend checking out this game that a colleague of mine made in Freiburg called Cartimento. Based, it's a pun from cart from part from partimento because it used to be a set of playing cards, but now it's digital playing cards, and you can practice learning this association between base scale degree and intervallic constellation. So, I have made a PDF of this presentation, and I'll send it. Um, I'll send it to you after this, so you don't have to write any of this down. Here's my analysis of 
uh, this little C major prelude. It's actually not in the Well-Tempered Clavier, but as a sort of introduction, I included a bunch of smaller preludes by Bach. Looking at the time, I'm not sure I have um, time to play through this, but I'll just play the, an the I played through it twice, so I'll just play the analytical reduction. He starts with up five, down, f down four. Then comes a carousel. Here's our, our model. So a sequence consists of a model and at least one copy thereof. Copied. Partial transposition. Basically head to the dominant and do this seven six suspension over a dominant. You might say that this piece consists of three modules. Up five, down four, one module carousel, and a dominant pedal. Some of you might be wondering, why didn't I call that a Fonte, Monte Romanesca? I don't know what that means. <laughs> the Germans were the first to identify this. So there we are, planning our terminological flag, but you have to respect it too. Carousel is the better term for this voice leading pattern. So we've got three patterns, and you can see how Bach inflected it. There's an advantage in improvisation to doing a figuration prelude because the figuration stays the same and you can focus on the throw bass and you, you basically you can automate the rhetorical inflection. Notice too how every time that there is any motion, any um, reference, however fleeting, to a neighboring key, I understand that as a mini modulation. As you probably know, Schenker in invented the word tonicization, tonicalisierung. It's a brilliant concept for this middle ground between modulation and, well, not modulation. I like to compare it to opening a door. A tonicization is opening the door to another key. Modulation is walking through the door. But to my knowledge, looking at 18th century treatises, there's no such thing as, as modulation. And we see this in Kaiser's analysis of Bach's C minor prelude, that every reference to a neighboring key is a mini modulation. And there's a real advantage to doing that because the logic of the connection between a bass scale degree and an intervallic constellation, it only works in the neighboring key. So like G sharp, let's just take in measure four here, end of measure four, G sharp, there's no point in calling that raised five. That makes no sense. There is no raised five, not really, unless it's like a little surface level chromaticism. But if it's if you're dealing with harmonized chromaticism, that is the leading tone of the neighboring key, and that is our familiar coupling of seven one to a six five chord to a five three. Now there's a nine nine six suspension here. But essentially, it's rule of the octave harmony plus a syncopatio dissonance. You might also be wondering about the dominant pedal point. Why are the figures in brackets? Because over a dominant pedal point, the second lowest voice becomes the point of reference. So every time I put a figure in brackets, I'm taking the second to lowest voice as the point of reference. CPE Bach, for instance, says to do that over pedal point. Otherwise, the figures make no sense. So I didn't stop there. For every single prelude, in my book, I transpose it to C major or A minor, but I also give the thorough bass foundation afterwards. And here I got rid of the bar lines because I wanted to encourage the reader to freely associate the music that's here and perhaps put it in a different meter. What do I know? I mean, one of the best ways to get beyond Bach's original figuration is to switch between duple and triple meters so that you can't fall in the same paths, the finger paths that, that, that you already know. So if you did this in like 6-4 or something, you know, you could, you could stretch out each harmonic region a little bit. And you can practice inflecting this in a different way. You can even practice rearranging the modules in a different way or, or inserting different ones or shortening or, or lengthening it or whatever you want. So I kept the little the little tick marks though so that uh, you could compare the um, the measure numbers a little bit a little bit easier, but this is essentially the uh, the whole thing that Volad does. You give the original, then you extract this backbone, this 
this foundation, this, um, it's like a lead sheet, an 18th century lead sheet, and then you can jam on it yourself. And this is, uh, to go back to the idea, to the topic of the free fantasia, most people don't know that the rule of the octave is very central to C.P.E. Bach's conception of improvisation. He doesn't name it rule of the octave but it's definitely, definitely the rule of the octave, as you can see here. The very first one is ascending, and there are two harmonizations. So this is all kind of difficult to see. So that's why in my book, as an appendix, I give the CPE Bach rule of the octave translation, uh, rule of the octave harmonizations in a little bit easier way, uh, m more digestible format. And you can by the way, apply the logic of rhetorical inflection to his harmonizations. So the first one is the standard, let's say, rule of the octave. That is so common that it's barely even inflected. And then he applies little tonicizations, mini modulations, and suspensions to it. And he inflects it uh, progressively as we go from 2 to 3 to 4 to 5 to all the way to 10 until you can see that it's in parts of it are almost a chromatic scale because all the, the, that's what he says the easiest way to modulate is to introduce the leading tone of the new key in the bass and then just make it a 6-5 chord or a 7-5-3 seven, seven, chord. And the other reason I wanted to emphasize uh, CPE Bach's rule of the octave harmonizations um, is because they're in C major and A minor. And there again, we have these two as like the base keys of which everything else is a transposition. So CPE Bach says, where does this bass line come from? Because, you know, that's a big, um, that's a big hurdle in using thorough bass is that generally the, the bass line is given to you. How do you invent your own bass line? And he says, invent your own bass line by connecting segments of an ascending and descending scale or it's not entirely sure it, it's not entirely clear what he what he means because ex his example is kind of is it a, is it a rule of the octave scale now Joel Lesser has a good a good article about this how Bach teaches us to compose I believe it's called and he talks he, I think he analyzes four of the um, well four of the well-tempered clavier preludes and shows how they can be understood as rule of the octave or as as base scale frameworks. So as a promotion, I have given my harmonizations, my realizations, excuse me, of CPE box base scale harmonizations um, for free online starting in the octave position, just to get you started in case this is a little bit too much. So my book is available in print or for the first time for this publisher as a PDF. So if you're like me, a um, tablet has become an indispensable part of your teaching. And so I'm really happy that it's available like that. So you can mark it up and, and it's just some, some people prefer it. So that's, um, that's where you can uh, either order or download my book. Volume 1 is the Major Key Preludes. Volume 2 is the minor key preludes, and there's a really extensive preface that is split between the two. Now, it's not a tactic to make you buy both of them. It, just, it was that we didn't want the, f the first volume to become, like, really lopsided. So if you want to read the whole preface, you'll have to buy uh, both volumes. So I hope this was useful to you. Thank you very much for listening, and I look forward to the discussion.